Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Kia ora tato. Kia ora tato. I'd just like to open with a prayer. Kororia kitatua he mongarongo. Kororia kitatua he mongarongo kite mata o te fenua. He fakaro pai kinga tangata katoa te na tato katoa. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Margaret Carfadu. I'm very pleased to extend a warm welcome to you all uh, in, to this Paul Reeves Memorial Lecture. Uh, I'd also, I'd particularly like to welcome Professor Paul Moon and also Lady Reeves. Um, it's a pleasure for Massey University to host this lecture here at Albany this year. Uh, we have a long-standing uh, collaboration with Vaughan Park Anglican Retreat. So um, over to you, John Fairbrother, Director of the uh, Vaughan Park Anglican Retreat. Kia ora tato. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa, kia ora tato. It's worth noting as Tawiki o te reo Māori this week. Lady Reeves, to you and your whānau, thank you, thank you. It's an immense privilege to honour the life, the memory and the legacy of Sapor. It's a legacy that is enriching and animating taonga for our evolving culture. In 214 marks the third year of this annual lecture honouring Sapor and the first to be held at Massey campus. The Governance Board of Vaughan Park and Retreat and Conference Centre is pleased to foster this cooperative effort with Massey University for sharing knowledge and understanding. In particular, the Governance Board recognises the enterprise and work of the Office of the Assistant Vice-Chancellor Māori, Pacific and New Migrants, along with Associate Professor Takani Kingi, Margaret Kafaru and Dr Lily George. Greetings, I bring you greetings from Bishops uh, Ross and, and Jim who uh, unfortunately are unable to be with us this evening. The Vaughan Park offers retreat and conference facilities to the church, academia, individuals, groups, private, public and corporate institutions along with an international scholarship programme. And overlooking Long Bay Beach and Reserve, Vaughan Park facilities offer much in terms of being a well-appointed learning and meeting environment, where calm, good food, comfortable accommodation are priorities. Now tonight we welcome you, Professor Paul Moon, Professor of History at Auckland University of Technologies Te Ara Potama, the Faculty of Māori Development. Professor Moon, thank you for accepting the invitation to honour Sir Paul with this year's memorial lecture. Your topic, What's Past is Prologue, Nostalgia and Utopianism in New Zealand, reflects Sir Paul's living legacy and has drawn considerable interest. Paul is a prolific writer, remarkable for his ability to communicate to a wide audience understanding and analysis of Aotearoa history. He is a major contributor in building the quality and capacity of New Zealanders to understand reflect and speak of our shared history in these islands. This has been recognised with his recent book Encounters being shortlisted for the 214 Ernest Scott Prize. Now following the lecture, rather than Paul taking questions, there will be opportunity to meet and share thoughts over a cup of tea, cup of coffee and the proverbial biscuit. So Professor, no my, hire my. Thank you very much, Margaret and John. Um, it's a bit like listening to my obituary, but never mind. Um, look, it's, it's a pleasure to be here, and it's, it's an honour really to be associated with the names of the previous speakers at this event, uh, Dr Manuka Henry and Professor Sir Mason Jury, both people whom I have huge regard for. Um, and while it's, it's an honour to be associated with them, it's an absolute privilege to be connected in any way with the name of Sir Paul Reeves, someone who in my opinion, for what it's worth, was one of the most remarkable people that this country's ever produced. Um, from time to time, and I didn't know him particularly well, but we did chat from time to time about certain issues, particularly religion. 
Um, and we didn't necessarily see eye to eye on that. Um, he, of course, was completely immersed or submerged, as I told him, in the Anglican tradition. And my views tilt very much towards the, the more extreme end of Protestantism, to the Protestantism of people like Cromwell and Milton. And uh, he asked me about this once, and I told him, and he, he had a bit of a smile, and he said, ah, you're a Puritan. And uh, there was more than a, a slight tone of derision in his voice, and fair enough, because Puritans nowadays, of course, associated with people who are perhaps morally uptight and prudish and joyless and so on. Um, and so I had to correct him, and I gave him a, an impromptu lecture, um, and I pointed out the fact that far from the Puritans being regressive in any way, it was really the Anglican Church that had not caught up. <laughs> and I, I, I made it reasonably clear. I pointed out, for example, that it was the Puritans, which was the first group in the Western world, that pushed for the rights of women to get the vote. They petitioned Parliament for this in the 1640s. So they anticipated the, the feminist movement, and particularly the suffragette movement, by two and a half centuries. Um, it was the Puritans also who pushed very hard for the right for people to divorce for reasons other than adultery. The Anglican Church at the time, of course, and particularly the Catholic Church, was very strict on this. They said you can only divorce... Um, for reasons of adultery, uh, the, the Puritans said, no, there are other reasons that you can get divorced. And particularly for incompatibility, they said it's, it's literally soul-destroying if you live with someone and that person is someone who you've grown to despise and you feel contempt for and it's making your life and their life miserable. They said on that basis you should be allowed to divorce. And that, of course, earned them a great deal of persecution from the Anglican Church. Um, the Puritans were fairly progressive in other areas too in terms of education. They were the first group to push for the right for everyone to be able to read and write, universal education for children. Um, they had a motive in that, of course, they wanted everyone to read the Bible, but even in that they were progressive because they had this belief that you have to develop an understanding of your faith based on your own views, not on what you're told by any cleric. And of course, that made them deeply unpopular with the Catholics and the Anglicans as well. In fact, some of them had to escape persecution and go to America, and they started up some learning institutions there, a few of which still survive. Uh, Yale and Harvard universities are good examples of that. The commitment to education was considerable. More so was their commitment to freedom of speech, that the Puritans were adamant that you should be able to say and publish whatever you want. The corollary to that, of course, is you have to live with the consequences of that, but nonetheless you should be free to do it. And Milton was a great advocate of this. His, his very eloquent uh, 1644 polemic, Areopagitica, makes this point that you should have absolute freedom to say anything. And he uses the, the metaphor of a cloister. He says, no idea is good if it's kept in a cloister. It should be exposed to the world effectively. People should be able to pick it apart and examine it, challenge it, try to defeat it, and only then do you know the value of your argument. Only then do you know the value of your idea. But if you keep it in a cloister, it has no value. It's just protected. And of course, that anticipated the liberalism of people like John Stuart Mill by about two centuries. Um, and mischievously, probably Milton used that metaphor of a cloister because it was a little dig at the Catholic Church where doctrine was literally repeated in cloisters without ever being challenged really or examined. But above all, the Puritans were committed to this idea that the message of salvation in the New Testament is one that's on offer to everyone that no one should be excluded for it. And the biblical authority for that is quite clear. It's in the Gospels, it's, it's in the Acts of the Apostles and Paul's letters and so on. But no one should be discriminated against. No one should be excluded from this message. And I said to Sir Paul that you know, the Anglican Church, your church, still continues to discriminate both officially and unofficially against certain groups. I said it's, it's narrow-minded, bigoted, um, elitist and judgmental. I was very cautious with my language. And... <laughs> And I knew what he would say. I knew in advance what he would say. He would either brush me off and say, let's talk about this another time, or give me the other ex standard answer, which is, well, you know, we, we are making progress. Rome wasn't built, in, well, not Rome, but <laughs> it's a whole <laughs> other entanglement. But things take time. And I expected one of those two answers, but I didn't expect the answer that he gave me. Because he said, you know, you're absolutely right. He said the Anglican Church does discriminate and we've been far too slow to address these issues. And he said, I've worked very hard for, to, to deal with this, but there are forces, obviously, that, that aren't keen on, on making the church as inclusive as it could be. And I was completely surprised about this because here was someone who was 
not only a former leader of the Anglican Church New Zealand, but recognised at the time as one of the foremost Anglican leaders in the world, admitting to the fact that that organisation wasn't as good as it could be. And I think that sort of response that he gave indicates the sort of intellectual integrity that he had. It's very easy to brush people off, especially if you're highly placed in an organisation, but it takes a lot of integrity to give that sort of response. Um, others of our encounters weren't necessarily that serious. We had a few light moments. There's one occasion, for example, where we were joking about the fact that we both had single-syllable names, Paul Moon, Paul Reeves, and what a benefit it was. And he started to reel them off, and he had a whole list of them, John Wayne and Tom Jones, and, and, and on it went. Um, I think we stopped and we got to Pol Pot. But anyway, <laughs> then, then, of course, in um, August 2011, he passed away. And as I said, I didn't know him especially well, but I think everyone felt almost that sense of a vacuum emerging on his, on his death, and with good reason. And so it was, as I say, an absolute privilege to be invited to give a talk in his honour. And when I got the invitation, and it had the name Sir Paul Reeves on it, my first thoughts went to my encounters with him. And only afterwards did I think about his career and all the, the various milestones in it. And I thought that's interesting, and that's really what I want to look at this evening, is that how we remember people, and particularly how we remember the past. Because history, for some people, is just a dry collection of facts and dates, and they're strung out like pegs on a clothesline. But there's a lot more to it than that. And a lot of it relates to our perception of the past. And one of the aspects of our perception of the past is that it's not shared. And we like to think it is. We like to think we all have roughly the same view of history. We do have the same view, perhaps, of certain events. We all know what happened on certain dates. That's not a problem. But how we perceive the past isn't shared. And it varies for all sorts of reasons. Cultural reasons are a big one. But one of the biggest reasons why we see the past differently has to do with our age. And the reason is that the, the older we get, simply the more that we've lived through, the more events of significance, the more periods that we've lived through. And these particular periods and events that we've lived through serve in a way like boundary markers in our minds. And the more we have, the more boundary markers we have, the, the more our perception of the past expands. And so generally, as a general rule, the older you are, the bigger the perception of the past you have the more appreciation you have of aspects of history. Um, and that's one side of it. But the other side, <coughs> excuse me, the other side is that the older you get, the fewer of you that there are. And so you have a broader perception, this isn't a personal comment on anyone, but you have a, a, a broader perception of things, but the fewer of you to share that perception. And so one of the aspects of our perception of the past is that it's a devaluing commodity. And through the miracle of statistics, I can illustrate this, um, if we imagine that you start to accumulate a sense of history about the age of seven or eight, let, let's assume, and I went to a school recently, and um, it's a girls' school, and they had a group of eight-year-olds there, and I asked them some questions, they all knew about the Christchurch earthquake, they all knew, um, I asked them who the Prime Minister was, John Key, another single syllable name person, and so about the age of seven or eight, we begin to acquire a sense of history. It's, it's very vague, but there's a sense of things happening around us that are bigger than our immediate surrounds and the people that we know. So if you assume that, first statistic is that roughly 87% of New Zealanders, aged eight or over, are old enough to remember the period when Helen Clark was Prime Minister. Now, judging, and I'm not trying to be too judgmental, but I think most of you here, in fact all of you here, if you were in New Zealand at the time, will remember the Clark government. you remember Helen Clark as Prime Minister. So we assume that that's a shared perception of, of history. We all have it. We all remember Clark as Prime Minister, except that it's not. So 13% of New Zealanders, aged eight and over, don't have that shared perception. The next figure surprised me. I had to do it twice. Um, the percentage of people old enough to remember David Longy as Prime Minister, 59%. And that is surprising because if you add in immigrants to that figure, it almost becomes around 50%. And in a couple of years, those of us who remember the time when David Longy was Prime Minister will be in a minority. So that, that we all sort of presume, oh yes, we remember that, but of course it's a shrinking group that we belong to. And the, the further back you go, the, the more slender the percentages become. Just two more. 9.5% of the population are old enough to remember Hillary's ascent of Everest. 
and 0.6% are old enough to remember or have some memory at least of, of Savage's election victory in 1935. So the things that we presume are common knowledge over time don't become that common at all. And you can see this displacement taking place in the case of the, the Kennedy question. Do you remember where you were when Kennedy was assassinated, when you heard the news of it? Certain generations will. Um, that's been replaced, though, by uh, Princess Diana in the same question. Do you remember where you were when, when you heard about her car accident and so on? And so things that we hold dear to us and we think uh, uh, parts of, or should be parts of everyone's history tend not to be the older we get. Um, why is that even important? Well, the reason is that these major events and these major periods that we live through serve like punctuation points in our recollection of the past. And it's rather like a paragraph. If you extract the punctuation points from it, you still have the same material, the same information in the same sequence. It's just the meaning isn't that clear. So these sort of major events, major periods that we live through, are a way of categorising our perception of the past. And one of the challenges that historians have is trying, trying to present this past in a way that's generationally neutral. Um, and I wrote a book on New Zealand in the 20th century, and I remember I was having some problems in the 1920s. I was trying to look up I think it was something to do with the Country Women's Institute or something. I was looking up some material on it, and I was complaining about this to a friend, and he said, oh, don't worry, by the time you get to the 1990s, it will be simple, because you've lived through it. And in fact, it's the opposite because the methodology you use for a period that you haven't lived through, you have to apply to a period you have lived through. So your age is disguised. No one knows how old you are because the book reads the same regardless of which period's being addressed. So that's one of the challenges that you face in these perceptions of the past. Perceptions generally become problematic. Even things we think to be true aren't necessarily true. If you look at sunsets, for example, most people can remember a, a beautiful sunset that they've seen. But that idea of beauty is absolutely a cultural construct. All they're looking at is a refraction, refraction of light through the atmosphere. Sunsets aren't absolutely beautiful. It's just we've been culturally taught to believe that. Now, you're probably thinking, no, that's not true. I, I know what a beautiful sunset is when I see it. A um, little clue about this. In 1844, October 1844, George French Angus, the artist, was travelling through the centre of the North Island. And he, he came to Mount Tongariro and he set up his tent. And one night he was looking at the sun setting behind the mountain. And he wrote in his diary something to the effect, this is a wonderful, glorious spectre that I'm seeing in front of me. It's just a, a shame I have the savages with me because I don't seem to appreciate it. Now, you might dismiss that as just sort of standard European sort of chauvinism, racism of a period. And it's, it's common in, in, in most sources from that era. But there's a bit more to it than that because... If he had gone back into European art 600 years ago and beforehand, he would have been hard-pressed to find a single painting of a sunset because they just weren't appreciated. The appreciation of sunsets in European art and European culture generally came about quite late, really in the 1600s and from then, from then on, and more so in the 1800s. But you don't see much of it in European art, particularly prior to about 1400. And in fact, in some European cultures, sunsets were seen as terrible things because they held to the onset of night when all the robbers and the, the evil spirits and the wild animals come out. So it's, it's a fairly recent thing that we've come to accept, this idea of beautiful sunsets, and yet they're seen nowadays as being universally beautiful. No one tends to question it. Sunsets are a minor issue, but landscapes more generally are interesting because we do the same thing. We've become very good at projecting our cultural ideas onto landscapes. Um, in fact, landscapes don't even exist in nature. We, we create the concept of a landscape. There's no such thing. Um, arguably, there's no such thing as mountains or hills. They're just nature, just biological and ge ge geological elements. We, we label things, we describe it, we contextualise it. And if you're not sure about that, try this one. Imagine that you've got a reasonable budget and you've got a friend coming from overseas to New Zealand for the first time. Think of the places that you're going to take them. And you probably end up taking them to perhaps the Bay of Islands or Rotorua or um, I don't know, Queenstown, somewhere like that. I suspect most of you aren't putting anywhere near the top of your list uh, mangrove swamp and the Pamir estuary. That's not going to be the, the great scenic wonder that you're going to take them to. And why is that? What's wrong with that? Because we have a, a cultural predilection to like certain things in the landscape and dislike other things. And again, this is relatively recent even in European history. The aesthetic appreciation of landscape is something that's come along really only in the last three, four hundred years. 
Uh, if you look at the, the world's most famous painting, um, probably the world's most overrated painting, Leonardo da Vinci's Mona Lisa, and you're probably all familiar with it, that um, sort of doe-eyed Italian peasant smiling at you. The interesting thing about the painting is the background, because everyone knows about the image of the woman, but the background's interesting because it's a landscape, and it's a pretty average landscape at that. And it's used really just to provide perspective, to, to give a sense of depth to the painting and to frame the sides of the subject. Landscape painting, for its own sake, without any people appearing in it, really didn't kick off until about the 16th century. Prior to that, in European art, there are next to no examples. And in fact, with our cultural ideas about the appreciation of landscape, these come much later on. We can almost date them to the second half of the 18th century. In fact, from a popular perspective, there are two writers that are critical in popularising two views about how we look at the landscape. There's William Gilpin with all his work on the, the picturesque, and Edmund Burke with his work on the sublime. And it's in the second half of the 18th century that these ideas about how we look at the landscape, how we appreciate nature, become popularised. Prior to then, nature was viewed completely differently. So the things that we assume to be absolutely true aren't necessarily the case. And this means that when we come to aspects of history, similar issues of cultural influence, generational influence, and other things that affect our perception tend to play a more important role than perhaps we realise. And this, this leads on to this issue of nostalgia. Um, nostalgia greatly affects the way we look at the past. And nostalgia was originally devised in the, in the late 17th century that the term was devised to describe, in fact, a medical condition. It was thought that if you, if you suffered from nostalgia and you suffered from it, it was a medical condition. It was the longing for a past that can no longer be retrieved. You have this craving for it, but you know it can't be retrieved. And there are various um, dimensions of it. The first dimension of nostalgia is that it's, it's a refuge from the present. And the nature of most of our lives from time to time in the present is they're not particularly pleasant. That we go through all sorts of problems and challenges and difficulties and when we anticipate the future, that can look just as bleak or even worse in some cases. But the past is there as a place of refuge. So no matter how bad things are now, we can go back to an episode in the past and that's secure. It's locked in. We've, we've coated it in this veneer of nostalgia and it looks very pleasant and appealing. So that's one of the functions of nostalgia as a refuge from the present. Ironically, it does the opposite too. It's a way of altering the past to make it more pleasant when it wasn't that case. So it's almost like a balm. If there are past experiences we've had that have been particularly unpleasant, nostalgia has the effect of soothing that unpleasantness, of smoothing over the rough edges and making it seem a bit more acceptable. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard the phrase, when something bad's happened and someone said to you, don't worry, in a year or two we'll look back and laugh at this. And that's exactly how nostalgia starts to, to play on our minds. It, it recontextualises our historical memory, it makes it what it isn't. People re react to nostalgia differently. Some people see nostalgia as a, as a source of joy. They recall a wonderful episode, perhaps they were at the beach when they were kids, swimming in the waves and coming out, drying themselves for 10 minutes, going back in the water for another half hour and eating too many sausages and going back, even though they didn't wait the prescribed half hour because you get cramp, which I've never met anyone who's got cramp from eating and swimming. But anyway... Um, they have joyous memories of that. Now, the interesting thing is other people can have the same memory and has the opposite effect. It prompts a sense of, of melancholy in them, a, a sadness that, yes, it was wonderful, but we'll never have that again. So different people, depending on their disposition, react to nostalgic events in different ways, and that, of course, affects the way they interpret history. Um, it can be a coping me mechanism. It can also be something that's used for political purposes and even commercial purposes. And in some cases, nostalgia can act, and this is an interesting concept, as a prosthetic memory, a memory of something we haven't had but we like to imagine it. And um, when I was researching this book here, Encounters, I spent quite some time doing observational research in all sorts of areas. And one of the places I went to in a certain time was Napier. They have these Art Deco weekends there where nostalgia is almost choreographed. And people do go there to experience what they think are the nostalgic peaks of the, the 1930s, particularly the early 30s. And they go there and they, they buy their um, imitation Clarice Cliff vases and listen to Benny Goodman and dress up in clothes of the period and, 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 and this sort of thing. And it's wonderful. And they, they, they really believe that they're recreating some sense of the spirit of the age. 
And that's, that's a phrase, in fact, that was used by one of the people I talked to. They said, this is the spirit of the age that we're evoking. Well, it's more a, sort of a glitzy, kitschy parody of the spirit of the age that they're evoking because it's highly selective. And this is one of the key aspects of ideas about nostalgia is that it selects which history suit us because no one goes to Napier for these Art Deco weekends to experience the troughs of the period. No one goes there prepared and happy and ex- full of expectation that they're, they're going to have a weekend where they have unemployment, poverty, homelessness and general misery because that's what it was like for a lot of people in the early 30s. So when they're talking about evoking the spirit of the age, they're really doing this based on a constructed memory. It's a, it's a prosthetic memory, something that doesn't belong to them but nonetheless props them up in a certain way. And there seems to be, ironically, a relationship between the extent to which our imaginations take off and the extent to which we have information to support it. And it works like this. The less historical information we have about a period, the more our imagination is able to fill in the gaps. And so, with very slight information, our imagination can balloon with all sorts of ideas about, and really fantasies about what the period was like. The more you find out about the period, the more perhaps you're grateful that you, you don't live in it. Fair enough. Napier in the, in the 30s is something that, and funny enough, most of the people I interviewed weren't even born in the 30s, so there's no way they could have had a memory of it. But at least when it comes to our own lives, you'd think that we're a bit more accurate. We know about our own histories. We, we can recall them quite accurately. But that's not the case either. I happened just by chance to meet a couple who had left New Zealand in 1990 and they'd returned in 2007, so 17 years later. What had happened, I'd left the end of 1990, what had happened is during 1990, one of them was made redundant, then the other one was made redundant. Um, They had severe financial problems. They managed to sell their house and get out of the country. Um, They'd both been made unemployed. They had some very serious issues with their respective families. Things were just bleak. Their friends had left them, and, and it was just a very bad time for them. They'd gone to Australia become reasonably successful and decided to return to New Zealand in 2007. And I happened to be there at the moment when they were unpacking in their, in their house. And the wife opened a box and it had a, a dinner plate there, that they part of their dinner set before they left. And she started talking to her husband and um, I don't know what her husband's name was, Jeff or something. He, he looked like a Jeff. And, they, and she said, Jeff, look at this plate. Remember the parties we used to have in 1990 before we left? And, oh, yes, and all of a sudden these nostalgic memories came flooding back. Now, if you listen to what they were saying, you would think that, you would think that, the, that 1990 was the best year of their lives because it was just all full of warm, glowing recollections of how fantastic that time was. Historically, of course, it was one of the worst years of their lives. But what's interesting is nostalgia tended to tip that on its head. The nostalgic memory was more important for them than the historic memory. And when the two vie for dominance, it seems that nostalgia trumps standard historical memory on most occasions. Um, And this issue of not being the same as historic memory is important, and it even has commercial implications. I know um, Alan P did a series of advertisements four or five years ago. It was advertisements set in the 1970s, and they played heavily on nostalgic images of the 70s in order to sell their product. And there's one great scene where there's a fairly rotund man in his 50s or 60s gets out of his HQ Holden station wagon, the window's down he leaves the keys in the car because obviously there was no crime in the 1970s and he's got just a singlet and shorts and jandals on, goes into the dairy and buys a meat pie and an L&P and of course these ads are focus grouped enormously and the reason why all those sets of images are important is because they, they pull on people's nostalgic memories of the 1970s every advertisement in that sequence of ads of course is set on a sunny day because it never rained in the 70s either <laughs> and yeah, that's a sort of a glib comment but there's an element of truth to that too because we tend to lodge in our nostalgic memories things that are pleasant and by and large we have more pleasant experiences maybe outside at the beach or whatever when it's sunny than when it's a horrendously rainy day so things like sunshine play quite an important role, funnily enough, in our nostalgia. And advertisers are very adept at adopting these ideas about nostalgia and inserting them into their advertisements because they know they have that appeal. Um, and it's something we, we succumb to, even in very general ways. Um, some people, in fact I've heard a lot of people say, things used to be much better in the old days. You, know, you could leave your house and not lock the doors and so on, and they go through the whole inventory of how things were better. And it's quite a seductive thought 
until you need something like specialist medical treatment, and then you're very grateful for living in the modern era. But nonetheless, this idea of nostalgia can take over, and you can think, well, it didn't used to be like this, it used to be better. And maybe in some cases it was, but the, it has the effect of obscuring some of our judgment anyway. Um, so it has a role in, in personal identity, but it also has a role in national identity, how we see ourselves. And I think New Zealanders, probably more than some other groups of people, have become very good at setting up these constructs of what constitutes a New Zealander. And nostalgia plays a big role in that. Even words like um, bloke, for example. Um, the term bloke has nostalgic implications for certain people, certain ages. Um, you may remember, you may not remember, the 1975 election. Um, on election night, Robert Muldoon was interviewed and he, he was talking about the victory and he said, this is a victory for the ordinary bloke. Um, and the interesting thing about a lot of this nostalgic language is it only applies to 50% of the population. There's almost nothing corresponding um, for women. It's almost entirely... <coughs> the language of nostalgia and identity in New Zealand anyway is almost entirely male language. That's another issue. But um, this idea of the bloke, and it, you can trace its pedigree back. You can go back um, through Fred Dagg, of course, exaggerated aspects of it, and, and Barry Crump as well. And it keeps resurfacing in slightly different incarnations, um, one of the more recent ones is the, the southern man image. And the southern man, man image has been used, and it's, it must be successful because it's been used for lots of products. It's used to sell cars, beer, meat, cheese, other things as well. And the southern man is meant to epitomise what the, the typical New Zealand male is, that he's, he's sort of physically quite fit. Um, he's, he's physically quite fit. Um, he's a person of few words, talks common sense, good with an axe, works in the high country. I've yet to find this person, but it's nonetheless, it's the epitome of the New Zealand male. And it's a stereotype based on all sorts of nostalgic themes that have no, no real place in, in how New Zealand actually is. Um, nostalgia even has commercial implications. I went through a list of television programmes that are remakes. That is a, a program that perhaps screened in the 1970s or 80s and someone's decided to remake the program. And what that means is that they're using the same title, perhaps some of the same names for actors, but completely different cast, completely different script, different script writers and so on. But they're just trying to draw on that. And they're, they're, I've got a list here. There's um, Upstairs, Downstairs has been remade, Hawaii, Five-O, Kojak, Minder. There's even a film of Dad's Army being made at the moment. Um, no, no word on close to home. But yeah, we, we, we live in hope. Um, but these sorts of things are almost a form of cultural archaeology where they dig up nuggets from the past and they polish them off and they, they try to present them as something that's, that's new but at the same time has a resonance with what we all loved. And it can be quite disappointing, I think, particularly in comedies that were very highly rated in one era and you look in great anticipation when you get the DVD and think, oh, last time I saw this was 30 years ago, it's hilariously funny, and you watch it and you, you, you struggle to just grin a bit. And it's part of the devaluing aspects of comedy, but also because our nostalgic recollection, in some cases, is best left at that. When we're confronted with the truth of what we recall, it's not always the way we remember it, and that can be a, a problem at time as well. Um, Another aspect of nostalgia, and I don't want to dwell too much on it, I want to move on to utopianism, but another aspect is the, the political value of it. And this is done reasonably subtly. Um, of course, we're heading towards, or maybe in an election campaign at the moment, and it's been interesting to listen to, I've heard, already heard a couple of politicians use this sort of line, and it relies on nostalgia. The line is this. When I was growing up in New Zealand, and then you fill in the desirable thing. So when I was growing up in New Zealand, we could afford to, a couple on an average wage could afford to buy a house. Or when I was growing up in New Zealand, education was, was affordable for everyone, or whatever else it is. You can fill in the desirable aspect afterwards. And that's a great line because it's subtle. It's not saying 1964 was a golden period in New Zealand because that invites everyone to scrutinise the year and criticise it. But this generic, when I was growing up, encourages us all to think about when we were growing up no matter how old you are, and you think, yes, things were easier because of the effects of nostalgia. They blur some of the realities at times. So nostalgia has that political value as well, and it's a great technique as long as it's not overused. The, the final aspect about nostalgia, and this leads into utopianism, is that nostalgia is fundamentally benign. 
It might be a bit silly, it might be romanticised, it might not be historically accurate, but it doesn't really, in most cases, set out to hurt people or to cause any problems. But the same can't be said for utopianism, because utopianism is the opposite, it's subversive, and there's a proportionate relationship that operates here, and that is that the more utopian the ideal is, the more subversive it is. The more perfect the future that's being promised, the more it threatens to overturn or subvert in some way the imperfections of the present. And there are good historical examples of this. Marxism is an example. Marx was quite clear that he said that capitalism will not ever evolve into communism, so we need a revolution. We need to overturn the imperfections of the present to lead to what he saw was the, the perfection of the future. And in the 20th century, it's an even more, probably the most extreme case, is the Nazi party with its ideas about racial purity and, and, uh, and this thousand-year Reich and, and all these other odd, to us, dystopian views, um, they were predicated on the mass killing of people, on organised genocide. And they're extreme examples, but they perhaps give some indication that, that of that proportionate relationship. The more you try to set up this ideal future, the more you start looking at overturning aspects of the present. And as a result, it becomes quite disruptive. Um, funnily enough, and you look at New Zealand history and you think, well, look, population-wise, we've always, always been a, a fairly small country. So we shouldn't really have that many efforts at utopianism. And that's probably a good intuitive way of looking at it. But I think it's precisely because we've always had such a small population that people have thought maybe we can get something going here. It's very hard if you live in a country of two or three hundred million people to try to convince everyone that this utopian scheme might work. But if you're in a country at some stages in New Zealand history with 150,000 people or so, there's much more chances of it taking off. And there are various utopian examples in New Zealand history. Um, one of the earliest ones that's reasonably well documented is the, the emergence of the New Zealand Company. Um, and it went under various names, New Zealand Association and other names. We'll stick with, for simplicity with New Zealand Company, founded by Edward Gibbon Wakefield. And at one level, it was a simple land trading company. The company would, the idea was they'd go to New Zealand, they'd purchase, well, not purchase land, they didn't always pay for it, or survey it or anything else, but that's another issue. But they would acquire land fairly cheaply and divide it into town and country plots and sell it at a profit to prospective settlers and those settlers would arrive en masse. They wouldn't just dribble in, they'd, they'd come in, in large numbers. It was a systematic form of colonisation. So far, so simple, except that Wakefield had a very strong utopian desire that underpinned this whole scheme. He didn't just want to settle people, he wanted to create a new society. He wanted a particular class structure brought into New Zealand. He wanted certain types of people brought into New Zealand, not undesirable types. Um, he, he was very clear about this, that he wanted to create a place that was spacious, that was, that was clean, a place where everyone could be prosperous. It would have its own justice system, its own taxation system. And he even went to the extent of hiring artists to assist him with this. In fact, if you look at most of the New Zealand art, probably prior to 1840, has some connection with the New Zealand Company, the landscape art, because the company commissioned artists or purchased art from ind independent artists in order to promote New Zealand as this utopia. And you can imagine if you're, you're in somewhere in, in industrial England in the early to mid-19th century, I don't know, somewhere like Manchester, for example, um, Frederick Engels wrote a very good description of Manchester and the Industrial Revolutions, and it's, it's horrendous. The, the, the terrible living conditions, the smell, the appalling working conditions, the general poverty, the grime, everything seems to coagulate around these big industrial cities. And imagine having a place like New Zealand, and if you look at some of the Charles Heafy paintings, for example, it really does come across like a paradise. And no wonder that thousands of people eventually brought into this, because this was the perfect future that would replace their imperfect present. And that's the utopian dream, except there's a twist in it, and there's a twist in almost all forms of utopianism, because they're not utopian at all. That's the deception. All they are is nostalgia thrust into the future. Because if you look at the type of society Wakefield wanted, the blueprint for it existed about three or four generations earlier. In England, particularly southern England, rural England, on the cusp of the Industrial Revolution. 
It's the sort of England that, that Constable painted, those, those types of images. Or you read about in the poetry of John Clear, or particularly Oliver Goldsmith in The Deserted Village. That idea of, of this bucolic paradise in England with people living in thatched houses with rose bushes outside and perhaps there's people playing sports in the village green that's surrounded by these great oaks and it's sort of a chocolate box lid version of, of almost like Midsummer Murder actually. It's, um, it's that sort of, and they play on it as well, of course, for obvious reasons. Um, it's that image and Wakefield really was importing that image and projecting it into New Zealand. There's nothing utopian about it at all except that it seemed that way to everyone. But the very essence of its attraction is the fact that it drew on people's nostalgic recollections of what life, imagined life, was like in rural England in, say, the 1750s or 1760s, before they were born, but something they had this prosthetic memory of. In the 20th century, there have been efforts at utopian thinking as well. Um, the state housing programme of the first Labour government is probably a very good example and to appreciate just how utopian it was, it's useful to think about what housing was like in New Zealand at the beginning of the 20th century. And if you lived in perhaps two of the most disgusting suburbs in Auckland, Ponsonby and Freeman's Bay, yeah, that's 20th century, yep. Uh, <laughs> careful what I say. Um, you'd, you'd appreciate exactly why there was this pressing need for some, some solution to the housing problem, and it was a housing crisis. Um, not just because people were living in overcrowded areas and, and housing was unaffordable, but for other reasons as well. Um, the housing was of bad quality. It was cramped in, in some streets. Houses were packed cheek to jowl. The toiletries didn't, toilet systems didn't always work. The sewage system didn't always work. There are cases where a house of 10 or 11 people, in the morning everyone would get up and just empty their potties out the window. Um, that wasn't so bad. What was really bad is when they had to go outside to the outhouse, they'd have to dispose of their solid waste, of their excrement, by digging a hole in the ground and burying it. Um, that's fine if you're going to dig a be deep hole, but if it's cold and there's a large number of you and you want to race back inside, what happened is people just put the spade in the ground, empty the bucket there and put that clod of earth on top of it, and that was it. So you can imagine what it was like when it started to rain and the stench was terrible, and it drew in rats and so on. The conditions were so bad that in the first few years of the 20th century, Auckland had a couple of incidents of the plague. So here's a medieval disease returning to 20th century Auckland. That's how bad the housing was. Now, admittedly, some of that was alleviated after the First World War, but the onset of the Depression accentuated some of the housing problems. So how did the government react? Well, they could have reacted by just providing emergency housing or, or basic housing to accommodate the, the overcrowdedness and some of the hygiene problems. But they didn't. They went one stage further and adopted this utopian view of, of what New Zealand could be like in the future, where governments cared about people to the extent that they would provide them with houses that were built out of good materials initially, that were laid out to accommodate modern appliances, and that were designed in various different ways so there'd be no stigma attached. No one would necessarily know that you lived in a state house because it would be just another modern house. It wouldn't be a single design that everyone would identify and, and poke their finger at. And so there's, there was this real sense of this is the utopian future we can usher in with state housing, and a great deal of enthusiasm about it. Um, it was also part of this idea of the, and we still, some people, hold on to it, this idea that New Zealand can be an egalitarian society, that we don't have huge gaps between the very rich and the very poor. And these are all parts of this utopian vision. But again, the twist applies as well. Because you don't have to go very far back to see the origins of some of these ideas. Some of the ideas of housing can be found in 19th century Victorian Britain with the church's approach to providing for housing for the poor, very limited examples of that. But particularly the Fabianism at the end of the 19th century, ideas about egalitarianism, ideas about socialism that's ushered in through evolution rather than revolution. These sorts of ideas were very influential to some members of the Labour Party that lay in dormant for 20 years, was suddenly brought back to life. So rather than presenting a utopian future, in some ways, the state housing policy was a fulfilment of a nostalgic recollection that people had of values they held perhaps in their youth or perhaps people a generation earlier held. So similar sorts of things happen. Um, more recently, there's the, the case of the Values Party, formed in 1972 in Wellington, in, at Victoria University. 
You can read into that what you will. And this was this really was, if some of you can remember, this really was a utopian movement for the time. Because their policies were so radical and so different and seemingly leading to a much more environmentally conscious future, that they did threaten to subvert the order of things. So they, they ticked that box in being subversive and they, they came across as being completely new. Um, their big concern was with resource consumption. We've got to stop consuming resources because it's bad for the environment. So the first way we do this is we, we stop the population from growing. How do we do that? Well, immigration is one way, but free birth control and freely available abortions is the other way. And so those became elements of the, the Values Party's policies. That wasn't enough. We have to ban advertising. The 1972 manifesto said that we've got to reduce advertising almost completely because advertising forces us to consume things and we've got to cut back on consumption. They even wanted to restrict technology because they said technology was dehumanising and again technology encourages us to consume more. They wanted to restrict building height throughout New Zealand to just three storeys. You could not have a building above three storeys because that obscured the, the view of the landscape. Um, they wanted to limit and halt economic growth and some parties since have, have achieved that policy, um, but not intentionally. Um, they wanted state ownership of farms in some cases, and even they wanted to establish a maximum income level, that once you hit that level, never again would you have a pay rise. That's the university model, we call it. And it <laughs> so it, it comes across as this very visionary picture of the future, except that, again, it really, in a way, describes late colonial New Zealand. Very few buildings above three storeys, much smaller population, much less advertising, much less consumption, much, much less technology. Now, it's not necessarily a direct nostalgic link, but it's certainly nothing novel about that because New Zealand went exactly through almost all of these policies. It just happened to be roughly a century earlier. And this is one of the, the key features of, of utopianism is that it tends to be imaginatively impoverished, whereas nostalgia is this very richly marbled thing. And so there's so much that we can extract from nostalgia and project into, ut into utopian futures. The future by itself has nothing that we can draw from because it hasn't happened yet. So we're, we're forced to look backwards in order to devise the future. Um, there are other aspects as well that perhaps show some of the changes in this, even in something as, as straightforward as gardening. At the beginning of the 20th century, if you looked at the, the better gardens, say in places like Auckland, you'd notice that around the villas there'd be sort of very colourful flowers everywhere and roses and so on. It was that English country garden look. And there's a definite nostalgic element to that. In fact, it was even advertised as the English country garden look. People were selling seeds at the time. And that seemed to be what a lot of Aucklanders wanted. And in fact, I, I can even remember in the 1970s, people who were born in New Zealand still referring to England as home. And um, the further back you go in, in your memories of New Zealand, you'll probably know people who also were born here, perhaps in the 50s or 60s, they might have been referring to home as England. And so definitely in the 1900s, there was a very clear connection. It was this nostalgic recollection of what they thought the golden age of, of English housing was and the sort of garden that existed. That changed after the First World War. There was a slightly different, substantially different sort of gardening taking place in Auckland. One of the things that changed, of course, was the gardens themselves. The lawns became huge. We went on average to 1,000 square metres for a section from, in some cases, three or 400 metres at the beginning of the century. So section sizes increased dramatically. A small amount of that was used for vegetables and so on. But by and large, a few featured trees, but by and large, people just had lots and lots of lawn after the First World War. And one of the arguments that's been proposed about this is that the desire for these big sections, which is almost unique in the developed world, is a nostalgic recollection of New Zealand farm life a generation or so earlier. After the First World War, there was a fairly substantial migration of people, Europeans mainly, from rural areas in New Zealand into the urban areas. And it's almost as though they wanted an urban meadow. They wanted their own tiny, something that recalled for them the sense of what it was like on a farm. Because according to some people anyway, there's no other explanation for why we suddenly mushroomed in, in these, these huge sections, a thousand square metres, quarter of an acre, 
which really weren't used for much. There are other things that, that support this. Um, if you look at some of the bungalows, in fact, there's almost very, very few, if any, left, but some of the bungalows from the 1920s that had at their front door a tree fern. It used to be more common, uh, and you can see photos of this in the 30s and 40s, but tree ferns were grown right next to front doors in houses in the 1920s in New Zealand, particularly in Auckland. And again, that argument is used to support the fact that in the late 19th century, it was very common for farmhouses in New Zealand to have a tree fern right outside their front door. So these motifs of a tree fern of large grassed areas which evoke something in the rural past were brought into urban New Zealand in the 20s. So nostalgia can play a role in, in gardening, but so too can utopianism. Because after the Second World War, there's quite a radical shift in some cases in the way people garden. Um, and if you can think of some gardens in Auckland in the 1950s and 60s, some of the more popular plants then were plants like oleanders and hibiscuses. And um, the argument is there that the hibiscus represents sort of a warm tropical climate and the oleander a hot Mediterranean climate. And it's almost an attempt to say we're not really as, as chilly and damp as we are in Auckland. We've, we've got some sort of tropical or Mediterranean days, one or two a year, that we can enjoy. And these plants will remind us of that or hopefully create that sort of ambience, even if the weather defies it. And so that's really reaching out. It's not looking at nostalgia at all, but reaching out to something new, a utopian version of, of gardening. And, of course, that falls out of fashion, like most gardening does. Um, but in the 80s and 90s, it's repeated except with slightly different plants. Instead of having a hibiscus, um, you can have a palm, another tropical plant hinting at a warmer climate. Instead of an oleander, you can have an olive tree, another plant hinting at a hot Mediterranean climate. So these motifs come back and forward. And so what you might think is just standard design of the time often relies on reflecting back on something because these nostalgic ideas have a great pull on us, so why not transform them into utopianism? Um, another feature of utopianism is that it operates on an arc. There's a period where it becomes very exciting and invigorating, and then after a while, there's a period where it descends and becomes a bit drab and mundane and even disappointing. And the key feature of it is that it doesn't sustain itself. Um, in a very small way, you could almost look at the, the internet revolution as something like that. If, if you can remember back to 1990, and I suspect this applies to everyone here, not one of us here had um, the internet at home or did internet banking. In fact, not one of us here even had an email probably in 1990. It's hard to imagine, but we managed to do without it. When that came about, when we started to do things like have an email, when we started to have internet connections and do our banking online and all the other sorts of bits and pieces, in a way it was revolutionary and it was subversive and it was part of a promise of something quite new. And if you go back through newspaper articles in the 1990s, for example, you can see this, that they're, they're talking about the future in utopian terms, about what the internet is going to do for us. One day, we'll even be able to buy things on the internet. And people scoffed at that in the early 90s. No, that will never happen, online shopping. These sorts of things that became quite revolutionary, they were subversive, particularly if you owned a bookshop or a CD shop, because your days already then were numbered. So those of us who have lived through that are familiar with the, the exciting possibility of the internet. But you talk to people who are teenagers who have been brought up with it, and there's absolutely nothing exciting about the internet at all. It's quite mundane. It's only three things for them, really. It's a shop, it's a place where they can communicate, and it's a store of information like a big library. Now, that's grossly oversimplifying it, but that's the, the fairly mundane expectation of what the internet does for them. And it's hard to explain to a 13-year-old how wondrous this thing is because it's something quite ordinary for them. So what's utopian for one generation can become quite bland for the next generation. And the biggest point about utopianism really is the fact that it can't ever happen anyway. And the, the great Austrian philosopher Karl Popper, who lived in New Zealand during the Second World War, dealt with this issue, and he said there's no way we'll ever achieve a utopia. Because what it would mean is that every single person in the country would have to agree on every detail of what the future society is going to look like. And he said that's impossible. And I, I think even in this room, imagine if, if we tried to get every one of us to agree on every aspect of what the future is going to look like. It's, it's just not going to happen in a modern society. And I, I'd go one stage further and say it's probably undesirable. I, I don't think it would be a great place to live 
in a country where everyone thought exactly the same about everything. That, that, that need for diversity, or even that need for um, what Durkheim called deviance, the idea that people deviate from the norm and do something that at first seems odd but later on becomes acceptable or adopted by people. Um, the suffragette movement could be an example. But in the 19th century, suffragettes were criticised in, in fairly horrible terms in some cases because they were doing things that were completely unwomanly and completely inappropriate for, for a lady anyway to do. And they were considered by some as deviants. But over time, of course, they've, they've taken on quite a different role and we've, we've seen them as pioneers. But it, it's quite clear as far as Popper was concerned that we'll never get everyone to agree on what the future would look like. And he went one stage further. He said, even if we could by some miracle, what happens when we get there? Because the day we arrive at Utopia, we've got a problem because nothing stops, nothing stands still. Societies keep changing. We're influenced by ideas and technology and so on. So every day we have to keep revising what the definition of Utopia is. And that becomes a problem too. Who does the revision? If I spend the next year trying to convince everyone in this room of what my ideal utopia looks like and we finally achieve it 12 months from now, the next day something changes, do I have to reconvince you all again? Yes, I do. And that's going to be very hard, in fact, almost impossible. And Popper concluded the only way to achieve that is through force. You have to force the masses to accept the utopian vision of a small group of leaders. And that leads probably, in the extreme case, to places like North Korea. That there's a utopian or belief that this is a utopian society, and it combines an element of isolation, which is very important, because the more isolated you are, the fewer ideas you're going to get, which makes you want to change your opinion, and where there's force used to impose the idea that what, what exists is the utopian version of things. And so we end up with this situation where utopia doesn't exist, not only does it not exist, it's informed, ideas about it are informed by nostalgia as much as by good history, if you can put it that way, and where there's no chance for utopia ever to be achieved anyway. It's just a reassembly of selected ideas from the past. But hopefully what you can see from this is that these ideas, on the one hand, seem quite frivolous, nostalgia and utopia. They're not achievable, they're not something that we can ever hope to get working in practice. And so, by and large, they've been dismissed. But hopefully what you can see by all this prodding and poking of them is that they, they give us an insight into how we think and give us an insight into how we construct ideas about history and aspects of the past. And they do that in a way that nothing else can. And I think that's what matters, and that's why these aspects are so important to keep exploring. Thanks very much. Paul, thank you. I'd, um, in remembering what you've just said, I'd be afraid to say anything. In the... <laughs> but thank you. As, as a token of, um, of our thanks from uh, Massey University and from Vaughan Park, I'd like to present you with this token and, uh, and say thank you for your time thank with you. us. And your as chair of the uh, Vaughan Park Governance Board. I'd like to say thank you very much, Paul, uh, for coming along tonight, endorsing what John has said. It has been a pleasure to have such a thought-provoking presentation tonight, and you have kept up the tradition of what we established three years ago. So thank you very much indeed. And I know there will be plenty of discussion and questions over a cup of tea at the end of this. The other thing I would like to do is to acknowledge Lady Beverly Reeves and her whanau. It is an absolute delight that you come and support and are here to represent all that Rodman is of your family. And thank you that you bring your whanau with you. So on behalf of Vaughan Park, thank you for the privilege of naming this
Well, please feel free to uh, return to the foyer, and um, there will be an opportunity there if you wish for a cup of tea or coffee and a biscuit, and uh, Professor Paul will be um, available, I hope, for um, an op the odd question or two in a conversation. So thank you, and we'll see you in a few moments. Thank you. It's difficult to know what exactly. I mean, it's one point here. I mean, 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 I